I met John uh, about three years ago. I was trying to figure out what you do with the thorium byproduct, which is a serious problem for the uh, rare earth mining industry. John's going to introduce a resolution to the thorium problem, essentially an answer to the United States energy problem. So I'm John Kutch. I started the Thorium Energy Alliance with a few other folks. You know, we want to assist in restarting rare earth production in the United States. But generally, when you're uh, finding things like monazite, you're going to find thorium, right? You're not going to mine rare earths in this country anytime soon unless we find a solution for what to do with the thorium. No one's going to build a billion dollar wind turbine factory in Oklahoma when they can't guarantee they've got a supply of dysprosium and neodymium. They won't do it because the finance guys won't let them. So that factory ends up in China. We're bringing a new trade case against China. This case involves something called rare earth materials, which are used by American manufacturers to make high-tech products like advanced batteries that power everything from hybrid cars to cell phones. We want our companies building those products right here in America. But to do that, American manufacturers need to have access to rare earth materials, which China supplies. I will make this statement, and uh, hopefully nobody throws anything at me, but I would go so far as to say there is no rare earth shortage. Here's a letter from the University of Southern Florida, reconfirmed previous studies. They basically throw away 22,000 tons of rare earths every year due to thorium content. So assuming you had a 50% recovery, that basically covers 100% of U.S.'s current consumption needs. And you see where China is and you see where mountain passes, but what's that purple one down there at the bottom? Well, that purple one is called the Monazite Placer Era. That was the heavy mineral sands business producing about 15,000 tons a year of rare earth elements as a byproduct of their mining. And as China came into the market and pushed prices lower, and as thorium became more and more of a regulatory obstacle, they basically just shut down all that production. So here's another place that there's potentially another 100% of U.S. current demand for rare earths sitting right there. Now, both of these are excellent sources of heavy rare earths. Now, if China would simply let the market work on its own, we'd have no objections. But their policies currently are preventing that from happening. Being able to manufacture advanced batteries and hybrid cars in America is too important for us to stand by and do nothing. We've got to take control of our energy future, and we can't let that energy industry take root in some other country because they were allowed to break the rules. So we go, WTO, we're going to come after you with the WTO, and you've got to quit doing that. And I told the people in Congress that you're going to lose that battle. So what they did for the last 18 months is they shrunk the output of their entire mining sector so that suddenly when they go, oh, you know what, we're going to give you that WTO thing. Ooh, we disagree on principle, but we're going to agree. Suddenly, internal consumption matches production, and the no, net result is there's even less. Monazite is a common waste product, and it's also typically associated with xenotime and some other mineralizations. And if you look at the people throwing it away, interestingly, it's other rare earth mines. You know, one of the rare earth mines, an operating mine in the U.S., actually throws away their monazite. Iron ore mines, a lot of them produce phosphates, and those phosphates have rare earths. And then the heavy mineral sands business itself, copper, cobalt, uranium, aluminum. There's so many places in the mining value chain. If the thorium problem went away, we could put the United States in a position uh, of challenging China very, very seriously. If you resolve the thorium problem, you resolve the rare earth problem. U.S. policy related to thorium essentially guarantees that China will continue to control the rare earth market. And that's because monazites, which are always, almost always, Tony, associated with thorium, are also an excellent source of heavy rare earths. In fact, if you look at it on an aggregate basis, that's the number one source for heavies. If we can't access those sources, we're essentially left with bastocyte carbonatites as the primary source, and they are not good sources for heavies. And that essentially leaves China in the driver's seat on heavies. So you can't run a, a, a technology-based uh, economy with half the lanthanides. You need them all. So the only way we're going to do that is essentially be able to bring the monazites back into the value stream. I've read every bill that's been out. In fact, I wrote parts of the Murkowski bill and I wrote parts of the Evan Bayh Senator Bond bill from the 111th Congress. The truth of the matter is none of the bills actually resolve the problems that exist with U.S. rare earth production. 
Congress basically ignores China's sovereign monopoly. Congress proposes additional studies, no resolutions. Congress proposes lowering EPA and Bureau of Land Management standards. Congress proposes guaranteed loans to the value-added end of the rare earth business, but essentially provides no money funding or any real mechanism to help junior mining companies. And if you look at a lot of these junior mining companies, they all have a serious thorium problem. How radioactive is thorium? It's a low alpha mineral. It takes 12 and a half billion years for it to decay one time, which tells you not much is going on with thorium. You could put a chunk of thorium in your pocket. It's not going to hurt you. You could carry it around for a week, a month, a year. When you're cooking at home and you fire up that gas cooktop, that gives off radon, sunlight, especially in high altitudes. There are so many things in our economy that we deal with every day that are measurably a hundred, a thousand, even a million times more dangerous. And yet we deal with them responsibly because we create industrial guidelines on how to handle this. Thorium is fertile and not fizzle. No matter how much you get together, it just can't react by itself. It needs a neutron source. You could have millions and millions of pounds of thorium, and the Chinese do in fact have millions and millions of pounds of thorium just sitting in piles, silos, bunkers, or just out in the open. And they can do that, that's perfectly legit because thorium is not water soluble, it won't get into their uh, water supply. It's very heavy so it's not going to blow away or drift away in the wind. Your body cannot metabolize it, that is untrue for any of the other actinides. Mining and refining uranium and highly enriching it is an incredibly dangerous, filthy process, whereas thorium, when it comes out of the rare earth refining process, is usable as is. It's good to go. There's no such thing as highly enriched thorium. It is what it is right out of the ground. So thorium rare earths policy equals energy policy. Thorium is four times more abundant than uranium. It's hundreds of times more energy dense than uranium in terms of usable energy. Six million times more energy dense than coal in terms of usable energy. So you got some very intense concentration of power there. What happens when India and China start consuming oil like the industrial economies do? Anybody my age or older remember? Price shocks. These price shocks happen on very, very minute constraints on supply, two, three, five percent. Suddenly, what happens is you have a 50 percent increase in the number of people in the world who use oil as part of an industrial economy. What happens when there's a 50% increase in consumers in the world? These price shocks will be a normal part of our entire future. The resources of the world are getting stretched thin. We've got a lot of conflicts over water, food, energy. We're losing jobs and we're trying to produce power from diffuse sources. That, that's what people would tell you is the problem with solar and wind. It's just the, there's a lot of energy there, but it's just too diffuse to try and capture, right? And so what is it really? It's a jobs program and not a very effective one. It all started back when somebody figured out how to yoke an animal to a stick. Then it went to fire, wind, water, coal, oil. And why was there no nuclear age? We fastened on to solid fuels and with a military purpose. The government wanted reactors that would create both energy and materials for weapons production. Now the molten salt reactor was invented by Alvin Weinberg, same inventor as the uh, light water reactor. This is not a paper reactor, this isn't something theoretical, this isn't something that we just thought up. The MSRE and the ARE and a few other liquid fuel reactors were built and run at Oak Ridge National Labs for over 22,000 hours. Alvin said, you shouldn't use light water reactors for civilian use, you should use thorium reactors because they're safe, they're non-proliferating, they're easier to manage, you know, they, they, they don't have any chance of having a runaway aspect to them. They're, the term today would be walk away safe. With a light water reactor, you're constantly trying to keep it from running out of control, right? Using your control rods, your damping rods. There's instability by design. The entire time they're trying to keep this thing as close as they can to something that's catastrophic. And without constant intervention, bad things happen. Because it's a solid fuel reactor, I'm really being generous. Best case, it'll use 5% of the energy, and then you pull out your fuel rods. Now nasty nuclear waste you have to store. Produces large quantities of plutonium, and the whole world's trying to figure out how to get rid of this stuff. With an MSR, you're constantly trying to keep the reaction going. The second you stop trying to keep the reaction going, vroomp, it just solidifies. That's what makes it walk away safe, among other reasons. If for some reason it got too hot, it essentially 
will drain itself into a tank. And you can actually reheat it and put it back up into the system. It can't blow up. It's not under pressure. It burns 99% of its fuel. It can reduce existing nuclear waste. Normal operational range is 7800C. This is where you can create miracles. It helps transition coal from just being used for heat energy to now we can take coal and utilize it as a material resource. Ending the combustion of coal and converting coal into liquid fuels. The normal operating temperature, split your water into hydrogen and oxygen, or you can use natural gas. End the need to sequester CO and CO2. Essentially put us on our own liquid fuel paradigm. Why can we do it here? Because in the United States, we have the largest coal reserves in the world, and these aren't dirty fuels with high sulfur content. These are the cleanest fuels in the world, and these fuels actually have more energy than, than petroleum-based fuels. The Department of Energy, 60% of their budget is dedicated to creating, maintaining, and, and doing research on nuclear weapons. They're not trying to figure out how to get oil from sands. That's not their primary business. We're not the only country, as you'll see, working on this technology. As a matter of fact, you could argue that the United States isn't really working on this technology at all, while China and India and a few other countries race ahead. And the other countries out there, countries we'd consider in the West, they are constantly looking to the United States for some direction. And they're saying, how do we work with this stuff? What, what are your thoughts on making a homogenous fuel or a liquid fuel reactor? And the response is nothing. The last response the NRC gave was fluid fuel reactors look promising and we promise to have regulations in place in the next 30 to 50 years. The CRC for the NRC basically says fluid fuel reactors, all the uh, regulations for that go here. You know, so, so there's a page in the, in the regulations, but there's nothing there other than like a little placeholder bookmark. That gives you a sense of our sense of urgency compared to what the NRC thinks is urgent. The NRC and the DOE have a hostile position to anything that's not uranium slash plutonium based. India wants to develop this, but right now the NRC has literally gone to India and Czechoslovakia and said, how about you stop working on this? We're going to just call this a DOE Kodak moment, because by the same thought process that Kodak found itself out of business, the DOE is going to find itself out of business, because China's developing this stuff right now. And the former Premier Sun, who's the head of the National Academy of Science, a brilliant the guy, educated Chinese at Academy. Drexel. I'm sorry, Chinese Academy of Science. He said, hey, we're going to commercialize the thorium reactor and we're going to control global IP. Hmm. If they have global IP, when we want to use this system to turn oil into coal or tar sands into oil, they're going to be making top line revenue right off us on our own technology. Our energy, no matter what, forever is going to cost more than their energy. They just announced that they have uh, run what they call a salt loop, put in neutronic stand-ins in the salt loop. When you start putting neutronic stand-ins in, that means you're, you're at the doorstep of commercializing this. What are we going to do then, right, as a country? They're smart. They got brains just, you know, like anyone. So they're going to have design, engineering, cheap labor, lots of resources. And if we add clean, abundant energy to that mix, well, that, where is that going to leave the West? We need to have two parties in this. We need to have competition. Monopolies uh, are going to hurt us. We can already see from rare earths what Chinese monopoly of rare earth has been doing to industry. Imagine if they had a monopoly on energy. The United States really needs to be an exporter again of something. And considering our fiscal, monetary, and trade deficit, whatever we're going to start selling, it's got to be big. And the biggest market in the world is energy. We're essentially chasing a shrinking uh, pie of oil, you know, trying to convert uh, tar sands. Five years from now, somebody's going to say, it's kind of like that ethanol deal. We were using two units of energy to get one unit of energy. In the 50s, we believed in crazy things like strategic stockpiles and stuff like that. Who, who, who knew? Weinberg was able to get funding for this thing. This is called the, uh, the fireball, maybe a little bit unfortunate name for a reactor. A six foot diameter ball, and that's the actual hot cell, the actual reactor chamber. And that thing put out 70 megawatts of heat for about seven hours in its first initial experiment. The idea behind it was that you would build a super bomber that could stay flying for months at a time, just like a submarine would back then. So we would put a crew up and they'd fly around like a submarine in the sky. And then we invented the ICBM, and so that idea sort of went by the wayside. 
but the nature of it uh, allowed them to do research. He was also able to access funding to develop the molten salt research reactor. So you might be asking yourself, gee, John, this thing, you know, it's proliferation resistant. Uh, it can't blow up because it's not in a pressure vessel. It, it uh, uses a thing that we commonly think of as a waste product. On and on, it eats other nuclear waste. Why didn't we make it? So we wanted to breed new fuel and especially uh, breed new weapons material, plutonium, uh, highly enriched uranium. They were going to do that with the fast breeder reactor so that they could put jobs in California. Mr. President, since you missed our meeting uh, when we had on uh, breeder reactor, you know, I wanted you to know that we sent the message today, Craig. I told Ziegler to tell the press that uh, it's a bipartisan effort that you and uh, Hollifield and so forth Fine. Been, had been Fine. bugging me about it. <laughs> now, this has got to be something we play very close to the vest. I am being ruthless on one thing. Any activities that we possibly can should be placed in Southern California. I told uh, Dr. David and, and uh, of course, Seaborg and the rest that we do it. So on the committee, every time you have a chance, needle them, say, where's this going to be? Let's push the California right, thing. Well, you do that? Incidentally, Mr. President, yeah. I am so delighted you released that $16 million on the uh, mm -hmm. improvement of the uh, enriching complex. Uh, good. That, that yeah. handles a bad uh, blood right. problem for Right. You. Good, good. And so it got killed. All of this business about breeder reactors and nuclear energy and the stuff is over my That was one of my poorest subjects, science and... I got through it, but I had to work too hard. I gave it up when I was about a sophomore. And the unfortunate thing is shortly after that, they realized the fast breeders were, you know, not a very good reactor design, kind of dangerous, could run out of control fairly easily. And so that got killed too. And so we've been in a 30-year winter of United States reactor design. And the molten salt reactor became this interesting uh, side note of history until fairly recently. Our hope is to commercialize a research reactor one of the things it could do is consume the most dangerous of the actinides and leftover byproducts of our light water reactors. We have all this stuff sitting on parking lots and casks right now and we're wondering, do we put it in Yucca Mountain? What do we do with it? You could use it as a fuel. So a quick lesson on how our proposed pre-commercialized reactor would run would create 14 megawatts of heat energy. There's two safety features that are inherent in it. If it ever gets too hot, the reaction stops. It gets too hot, cools down, gets too hot, cools down. So for whatever reason that would be making it too hot, it would just pulsate. If it got really too hot, there's a little thing called a freeze plug in here. In the original molten salt reactor, essentially just had a fan blowing on a section of pipe that froze the fluid into a solid. And when the electricity to the fan stopped, like what might have happened in Fukushima, the fan stopped blowing, the salt melted, the whole thing flushes down into these storage tanks, which are divided in such a manner that no reaction can take place. Now let's talk about the reaction itself. Here's the pump, here's the loop. Goes around in a little circle. That's it. And the nature of it is beautiful. You don't have solid fuel zirconium coated rods. What you have is a narrow section of pipe, right? The cross section just isn't big enough. No reaction can take place. No reaction can take place. Comes into the chamber. All of a sudden the cross section gets really big relative to the small pipe. Reaction starts taking place. Gets hotter, 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 hotter. Goes out here, goes through a heat exchanger. We could have a heat loop or a turbine hall or both. And then it goes back around again. You don't have triple and quadruple and quintuple redundant pumps. You have one circulating pump. It's not a cooling pump. Remember, this doesn't need to cool. Well, these things run at 800 degrees Celsius, right? A, a light water reactor or a really good coal-fired furnace can maybe run at about 400 degrees. 400 degrees, the best thing you can do is, is steam water. But at 800 degrees, you can make fertilizer, make liquid fuels from coal, all sorts of things that a process heat. We could cut out the whole electrical generation portion and go straight to using this thing just as a heat source for chemical reactions and processing. Relatively small to give you a scale, that's about six feet in diameter and 18 feet long. It's very compact because it's so energy intense, right? A 200 megawatt facility really wouldn't be any bigger than a 12 megawatt facility. Maybe 60 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet. You don't need a containment building because there's no pressure, right? You know, it's running at atmosphere or even some people would say below atmosphere. It's almost running in like a quasi vacuum in, in some parts of it. You could, if you were uh, not affected by uh, neutrons, you know, pounding you, you could actually lift the lid off one of these things and look down into it and it would look sort of like a hot tub. When the salts are molten, slight blue tint to them, thin and as clear as water. Isotopes, things that we call waste today, are actually commercially valuable things. So we could have industrial and medical isotopes. 
something you can't do readily today with a solid fuel reactor because all those valuable isotopes are locked up in the zirconium and waste fuel of the solid fuel rods. The fact that it's so hot allows you to use a new generation of turbines. Brayton cycle turbine, instead of being the size of this hall like a steam turbine, would be about the size of this desk. It's another reason why you can make these things so compact. Airplane is much more sophisticated than a molten salt reactor. Molten salt reactor is basically like the radiator in your car. Fluid goes through, hits an impeller, goes into the hot engine, comes out, gets radiated out. If your car gets too hot, it pushes the radiator fluid into a reservoir. Once it cools down, pulls the fluid back in. That's called load fouling. Molten salt reactor can follow a load, but that's it. That's as complicated as it gets. These flying things are way more complicated and much, you know, there's people inside them. You wouldn't have any people near the hot cell of a molten salt reactor. I sat down with Senator Evan Bayes, staff, and the senator, and in the end, he basically said, I don't want to use the word thorium in a piece of legislation because it's going to attract attention. Now, he also agreed with me that if you could create a rare earth cooperative, you could solve the rare earth problem. So what do you do? Move all thorium bearing rare earth products to a centralized rare earth refinery. The refinery would be funded by OEMs who are desperate to get a supply that's not Chinese based. So Hitachi, Mitsubishi, you know, Boeing, anybody who wanted to actually own some of the uh, offtake would invest into the OEM refinery. So now you have your customers as owners of the refinery. So not only have you tied yourself to your end users, but you're saying to them, hey, on good years, we're gonna have a profit because we're a co-op, we have to write you a check back. So now you're tied very, very closely to your suppliers. It enhances access to capital for those junior mining companies because they have a real offtake agreement they can show their bankers. It eliminates the need to lower environmental standards, to rush projects. The structure that should be impervious to Chinese sovereign monopoly. That solves the rare earth problem. Bring jobs and direct investment back into the United States. In all the countries in the world who are sick and tired of being forced to move their factories to China. It's just bad news doing business in China right now. If you don't believe how desperate they are, just look at Mali Corp. They can barely offer any usable heavy rare earths. But as soon as China embargoed Japan because of that ship captain, fishing captain thing, Japan just was like, oh, here's a half a billion dollars, Mali Corp, just on the hopes that you'll be able to provide a second source of rare earths. I can't tell you how many calls we get. When are you going to do this? When is this going to happen? Of course, there's some companies who love that, right? They love the fact that this regulatory issue protects them. And we're saying, you know... They don't have any thorium in their rare earths. Very, very yeah. little. And they dump theirs on a tailing site. We're saying, look, it's great that you want a trillion dollars. And that's probably the only thing that's important to you. But I've got two daughters. I live in this country. All of my family's here. And they need a future. They need jobs. So we can all basically stick with a program that's good for you while America is bled white. Or we can say, hey, let's remove the problem, create the centralized rare earth refinery in all the countries in the world who are sick and tired of being forced to move their factories to China. They can now come right here. And suddenly, in places that are you know, industrial deserts, could suddenly be blooming in technology companies. Where we're going and what I think is much more important Proposed language creates a regulatory pathway for thorium energy under a federally chartered corporation. This federally chartered corporation would be completely financed by private money. This reactor, it works, it works forever because fuel is a byproduct from the mining industry. You know, we don't have to necessarily be in a foreign theater fighting for pipeline passageways or somebody else's oil. We can be totally independent and we can still make electricity and that electricity can go down a power line and right. plug it into your car. So we want people to know this is real and that our government has done this. And it's not like, well, you know, we, we think we can or somebody had a theory or they got it working for five minutes or it was a cold fusion fake. No, they ran it for 22,000 hours. That's five years. The research that was true for rare earths is doubly true for the, the nuclear aspect. And what we keep telling Congress is the day the Chinese start fence posting patent IP on this technology. No matter what you do is, is private sector, is government, as governments, you will never undercut them in the price of this reactor. The staff are generally fairly good at understanding what the issues are. 
Republican or Democrat, when you're on the Energy Committee, you generally take it seriously and hire some good staff. And, and the staff understand, they just, then they, they say, yep, but it's an election year, or there's some other political reason why we can't do this. Do you want to support or, anything radioactive? Yeah, we, you know, it'll give us, put the stink on us. These things work. There's no physical reason why they don't work. It's the interference of man's bureaucracy that keeps us from doing this. Republicans and Democrats both agree, makes perfect sense, and yet we still can't get introduced legislation, and it's just... Thorium isn't dangerous to work with, handle, or store. That's what our legislation that we're pushing with says. Tiny little pebble that holds back this giant boulder of innovation. And once you do that, all of a sudden, boop, that pebble comes out, and we restart rare earth. We, ha we open up the possibility for thorium energy. Everything starts happening from that point on. What kind of metallurgy are we looking uh, in terms of the uh, thorium salt uh to contain the salts, molten salt in a thorium reaction? Right now, the most likely candidate is something like Hastelloy X or Hastelloy N or okay. Inconel 600, just super high nickel stainless steels. You know, there's some naysayers. The metal started to corrode from the salts, or we started getting fractures, from, and it's like it wasn't true. They absolutely proved it. They proved it back in the 70s, but it was, it was more of what people thought when people started to criticize it. They're, they would just say, Jim, could you postulate on what the problems would be? And they'd be like, well, you know, salt's, salt's very corrosive. Salt's my corrosive. Car, yeah. Look at their fenders. You know, it's got to be the salts. And then that just got transliterated into people saying, oh, uh, well, salts will corrode the reactor. And, and it was never true. The Oak Ridge guys were like, no, no, no. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't corrode like that. There's obviously other engineering issues. Uh, gas removal, byproducts removal, valves that can work at that kind of a temperature. I'm, I'm not saying, give me $100 million and I'll have a reactor built in a year, you know, but give me $100 million and I guarantee you I'd have a very functional reactor in five years. I'm John Kutch, Executive Director of the Thorium Energy Alliance. Thank you for taking the time to learn about thorium and rare earth, reactor designs, legislation, and other areas related to creating a clean, safe, sustainable thorium energy future. I'd like to invite you to my hometown of Chicago for the fourth annual Future of Energy Conference presented by the Thorium Energy Alliance. And I think that uh, people should be impressed by the breadth and depth of our speakers from Joe Bonametti. You gotta be able to take that fluid in and out. Who has the uh, ability to manage very large projects for the United States military. All sorts of things that give us the advantage and they're all based on energy. Colonel Rogi manages energy systems for the United States Army and the military. Canadians such as Dr. David LeBlanc. We could have 100% of the world's electricity, 2,500 gigawatts, without increasing the mining we're doing already. Who have done fantastic work in basic reactor design Designs. And the ones that are missing were just removed from simple fluorination and sparging. Kim Lawrence Johnson, who's doing fine works with salt chemistry, and on. Thorium Energy Alliance is a 501c3 corporation in the United States of America. We're a nonprofit, we're tax deductible. We've been very successful in many ways, but we have a lot of work to do. I hope you're inspired to take that step and join us at the conference there is a real possibility to change how things work here. We can prevent pollution. We can use a virtuous cycle of byproduct from rare earths to make heat, to make the things we need for the society we want to live in. And of course, you can make vast amounts of electricity. That's why it's worth doing. Please contact us at the Thorium Energy Alliance if you have any questions. Hope to see you in May.